55. Starting in December, Fishing the DMV will be cutting back to only airing one episode per week until we hit our first Patreon goal of 100 Patreon supporters. We are only 55 members away from achieving our first goal. For less than a pack of Cinco's or buying a jackhammer chatterbait, you can help support the show. Patreon supporters will receive a special monthly discount off all their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Again, that's a special monthly discount off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Access to a private Facebook group community. They'll be entered into weekly prize giveaways with the winner being announced during Monday Night Live. They'll have access to special members only videos and live streams, part of monthly competitions that we put on, and so much more. Again, we are only 55 members away from achieving our goal. And once we achieve it, we'll be putting out more and more episodes each week. If you would like to support the show and join us on Patreon, link in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. Jared Mounts. <clears throat> so for a long time now, I'm going to say since June, I've been playing telephone tag with this man, begging him, just like trying to get the first date to come in and talk about this stuff. Um, and we finally, I finally got you to say yes, <laughs> Jason Halliker of the Department of Wildlife Resources. He's got some fun stuff to talk about for the people that like to chase river smallmouth. Thank you so much for coming in. Yeah, well, this is our third date. This is it. Yeah, oh, you're right. This is our third date. <laughs> so, but yeah, I like to play hard to get. Um, this has been an incredibly busy year uh, for our shop and for me personally. Uh, it's been really rewarding. We've been doing a lot of great work, but it was exhausting. So I didn't want to commit to it before I could catch my breath for a few minutes, but also, you know, it took a little while before we had the results. And that's, that's the nature of, of fisheries. You, you got to be patient with some of these projects and the project we're going to talk about today is we have to be patient with that too, because we have to work the bugs out. So, but it's I'm, cool. Yeah. It's, cool. <laughs> it's fun. Yep. So honestly, I think we just start, I mean, I guess from the beginning, like how, I heard the rumors, but the rumors aren't reality. So when did this whole thing start? When did you get involved? Were you always involved? Like, and how did we get to where we are today? I, I became involved when I became a biologist uh, three years ago. I took over the, the, the Shenandoah River systems. And so part of that was assisting the Front Royal Fish Hatchery to raise smallmouth bass. The Front Royal Hatchery has been around since the 30s. It was built by the CCC and it was originally built to raise smallmouth bass and sunfish. Hmm. Um, since then, you know, it, it's, need, it's needed upgrades badly. And the, the ponds were all dirt ponds. They're, they were falling apart. We weren't able to raise as much in there. Hatcheries are tricky because the water source is from Patches, Passage Creek, which is a fairly clean water source. That's good. But there's predators in there just like any other resource. There's smallmouth in there. There's sunfish. And... When you have a hatchery system that basically has an open grate allowing water to come into the system, you're going to get eggs from other fish species that you're not raising, and you're going to get fry from other species that you're not targeting. And so picture putting 15,000 musky fry or smallmouth fry into a pond that's all, all set up and ready to go, and you have a dozen green sunfish in there waiting for them. By the end of the season, you harvest that pond, you have trophy green sunfish and about a hundred mm. smallmouth. It's the most expensive sunfish ever bred right That's there. That's right. And then the, <laughs> the least desirable. Yeah. Um, so. How long was it dormant, the hatchery itself? Well, we we tried to raise fish mm -hmm. there, uh, you know, all throughout that, that time frame. Mm. Uh, it was only dormant when we were able to secure the funding from the settlement. Uh, mm -hmm. from the the mercury right. contamination mm -hmm. settlement and so once the construction started it was it was shut gotcha. down and and four new lined ponds were put in and they're fantastic um it's you know working with up-to-date technology is just mm -hmm. amazing you know after the you know 16 years of frustration of seeing those dirt ponds just not producing what we what we were hoping mm -hmm. Uh, those new line ponds and the infrastructure that they have um, to drain down the ponds is just amazing. And then they also constructed a harvest pavilion, which has uh, about 
I'll say 10 or 12 outdoor raceways. They're maybe about three quarters as long as Jake's bait and tackle. And so you can hold right now we have catfish in there temporarily as we stock them out throughout all the impoundments throughout the state. And uh, we can also raise smallmouth in those har in that harvest pavilion, which we'll talk about some of the tribulations with that. Uh, we still have the concrete raceways outside. They're they're fair. They're still old, <laughs> but they're still functional. And, and we utilize that, that for for smallmouth rearing. Um, and then the the biggest thing is we have filtration to the hatchery now there's these giant drum filters that take water in from passage creek and if you know they're the filtration is incredibly small so a fish mm -hmm. egg or fish fry cannot come through mm -hmm. that filtration and infiltrate our new ponds mm -hmm. and that is so key um to this system because we don't have those predators in there eating up all the young fry smallmouth that we would be putting out there keeping our fingers crossed the other big thing is the ponds hold water well, they don't leak. And the, the big thing with early life stages and these young fish is you need a good zooplankton bloom. So you need to fertilize the pond, you need to take care of the pH, the dissolved, dissolved oxygen. There's aerators in the pond. There's these big, um, you know, there's stationary blowers that, that move the water and push the water mm. just to keep the, the, the environment within those ponds mm. very healthy. And so when you're, when, when you don't have a leaky old pond, you're able to keep that water in place and it's not flowing through as rapidly. And so you can get a good solid zooplankton bloom, which those tiny little smallmouth need to feed on as soon as they're pretty much as soon as they go in there, they start feeding on that. And if you don't have that, they starve, they're gone. That's that. Could, hmm. could I, I want to ask a question about the, the filtration system and maybe people watching or listening on on. Uh, Apple Podcast or Spotify have the same thing. When I think filtration system, I'm thinking like a Brita filter. I'm thinking something that has to be constantly replaced. Is that something that's a one and done or is that something that needs constant upkeep to make sure it, it, it works per correctly? Good question. The filter is tricky and moving water through a hatchery, there's always bugs. Um, and so there are some challenges with that filter. You do have to check it on a regular basis. It will um, ac accumulate leaves and sticks and stuff like that. Now there are two conveyor belts uh, at the intake of the hatchery that are supposed to remove all those leaves and debris. But sometimes, you know, if, if they would break down or, you know, whatever the case may be, you, you do get some, um, some things clogging that filter. And so you do need to keep up with it. There are sprayers that help, you know, it's almost self cleaning and mm. the debris will roll out of there, but it, it can get really bad and, and get really clogged. And so you have to be on it. The other tricky thing is if you turn one valve downstream of that filter, and close another valve, you know, a different way, it's going to change your water levels a little bit. And so you, you're constantly tweaking that, that filtration, um, inlet to this, to the hatchery. And it takes a while to, to get that, um, down. In fact, the, the indoor part of the harvest pavilion, where we have a couple indoor raceways, uh, we're commonly turning on one valve and turning off another valve at the same time. That's so stressful. Good Lord. It is. So you don't have to go up and reset the filter. Um, you know, we luckily we're, we're getting right now we have our hatchery manager, Wayne Pence up there, as well as Matt Yonkers, who's the technician or, or the 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 um, fish culturist. He's part time. So there's not a lot of help up there. We go up and help as much as we can during the peak seasons, but they are going to get an assistant hatchery manager. They just um, finished up the interview or not the interviews, but they the application process for that. Oh, awesome. So. Hopefully you get a nice boost of energy with that new assistant manager and that'll really help, you know, keeping up with some of that stuff around the hatchery because it's, you know, it's brand new, but it doesn't stay brand new for very long mm -hmm. and you have to keep up with some of the new mm -hmm. technology and, you know, Wayne's did a great job learning the technology that's up there because it's totally different than wooden board to dam up pond. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. very right. different than that. So it's... uh it's it's really awesome, but there there is a learning curve to it. What's sure. the critical period of time with like I gotta imagine like you were saying too with smallmouth because I've always heard too they're very finicky. Like, is there a time period when they reach a certain size or age that that they become easier or less susceptible to, uh, you know, disease or whatever? Is there is there a really critical period of time when from that time they're hatched to that growth? We honestly um we didn't really see a whole lot of issues with our mm -hmm. young fish in the hatchery mm -hmm. the you know the the shenandoah river itself that's a whole different conversation right. you know we can have that an, another day perhaps mm -hmm. 
another project we're working on. But um, in the hatchery, the fish were, were very healthy. Mm -hmm. And the number of fry that went into the ponds, we were, we were very successful in getting a very similar number out, which is kind of unheard of. And how big know. are they when they're going in? You say fry. Uh, they're, they're, they're literally sack fry. So they still have their wow. egg yolk sack. And so they it, it, basically, as soon as they swim up out of the nest gravels, and maybe we should kind of, you know, talk yeah, about the, the whole process now um, rather than just nit and pick it. But basically, you know, this year we started a little bit earlier. We were excited to, to begin, you know, broodstock collection. We didn't want a high water event to blow us out. Uh, we chose the Shenandoah River to collect our brood from because mm -hmm. the Shenandoah River is, is doing very well right now, especially the South Fork. And so uh, we were able to collect from uh, a multitude of sites. I didn't want to go and inundate one site and remove all the mm -hmm. brood fish because obviously the anglers would be frustrated mm -hmm. by that. And it, these are a lot of our sample sites too, and that would affect our data at those sites as well. Mm -hmm. So I was careful in selecting sites that could handle uh, the removal of some brood fish. The, the ultimate goal was to take these brood, brood fish back to those gotcha. sites. And so we brought uh, about 120 brood fish into the hatchery. They went into the, the the lower concrete raceways, and we can do the the YouTube thing now if you want to, and and I can show you some overhead shots. Um, wow. Are you ready for that? Yeah, go for okay, it. Okay, so you can see the the four new ponds there that are starred. Those are the lined ponds, and then just down from that is the harvest pavilion and the concrete raceways, and so. Within those concrete race, raceways went the broodfish. Now they look like they're they're very organized, but the the broodfish actually have access to the raceways next to each other. So we tried to put pairs into each individual raceway. They don't behave like that, <laughs> um, and they're very hard to sex visually. You okay. know, you, you, right, can, right. you can tell you know a pretty robust female is a female when it's when she's getting ready to lay her eggs, but. Earlier in the season, mm -hmm. you know, maybe that's just a fat male. It's kind of hard to tell. Mm -hmm. um, so we put them in those raceways. We tried to pair them up the best we can, and then they went and mixed themselves up, you know, how they wanted. And in those concrete raceways, we have piles of gravel, you know, just like you would have out in the wild, basically. Mm. And they use those nesting sites, and you'll start to see the males fanning that gravel. We also used Mari River broodfish just as a, diff as a different example. You know, we, we wanted to Why see- Why the Mari? Um, just to see if they do better in the hatchery. Okay. Um, maybe the, the fry survive better, hmm. you know, once we we get the fish, um, you know, just as, a, as another treatment basically for, for our, our experiment. And we also wanted to see if the Harvest Pavilion, which was actually designed, you know, with when fish, I think it's Fish Bro, when they designed this hatchery, they designed the harvest pavilion to raise about 30,000 fingerling smallmouth uh, throughout the whole process. We weren't sure about the harvest pavilion. It had never been used before, but we wanted to try it. So same kind of thing, different experiment. It's under a roof. Does that have an impact? Not sure. Uh, we put the gravel in there, put the pears in there. In there, they don't have access to each other. So it's a little more important to make sure you have the males and the females together. Otherwise, it's right. not going to work. What size gravel? When you say gravel, immediately I'm thinking of like maybe what's in a driveway, but then you said nature. Could could you uh, just like bring a, a little bit more light on that? Yeah, like what yeah, size? Yeah, we use pea gravel. We've used just driveway like 57 gravel before. Huh. They're not necessarily particular picky, you know, okay. when it comes to this because it's either concrete or it's this gravel pile and they want gravel. Hmm. And so okay. they, they pretty much hunker down over it. We have, we've had rogue fish, you know, spawn in a spot that's like, oh, there's a little <laughs> bit of broken up concrete there that can serve as a nest, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And and again, we've done this before. You know, we raised smallmouth in Virginia back in the, you know, late aughts to early teens in that time frame. You know, we tried to do a very large scale project, larger than this project, but we couldn't raise enough to really make heads or tails of the results. Hmm. Um, the good news is, even though we had trouble raising all the fish we needed, uh, we, we did see stocked fish in the wild contributing to the age one year class fish. And so it's been done before. It mm. can work. The question is, at what level can we really contribute to this to the population? Mm -hmm. Because if it's just single digit percent, I don't know if that's really going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. My goal with this project is instead of stocking an entire river system, which would take maybe hundreds of thousands of fish, 
actually target areas. And so we have two uh, areas that we're targeting. They're both 16 kilometers in length. One's on the South River from Cremora down to Grand Caverns, and one's on the South Fork Shenandoah from Newport to White House. The reason we chose those sites is we have a lot of historical data on the population. You know, we're able to do what's called depletions on, at those areas, and we can essentially, the goal is to remove all the fish from that particular section of stream, and we can use do some statistics and we can look at how many fish per mile are in that stretch, how many adult smallmouth are in that in that stretch and then extrapolate that out to the whole river so mm -hmm. my hope is that i can uh single out a 16 kilometer stretch and inundate that with with these stocked fish not necessarily to make up for a poor year class but to smooth out the ripples you're going to get a big year class you're going to get a tank year class let's make it more of an average every year yeah. if we can and that we can that mm -hmm. way we can consistently have good fishing uh for years to come mm -hmm. I, I don't know if we'll yeah. ever be able to raise enough fish to right. to repair an entire river system, but I, this may be a step in the in the right direction like to yeah. you yeah. know um, ramping this up to the next level, which you know we'll we'll talk about that for next year. And it, it is it's supplemental stocking. I mean that's what it is. It's making sure that the lows aren't as low and yep. the highs aren't as high, but it's just it's steady. And I think this is a great pair with the Odenkirk episode that just mm -hmm. launched yesterday, where he went completely you know in the weeds with the F one stocking of all the lakes, and it's about having the data so you know how many to stock. Mm -hmm. But what we didn't talk about was the river systems as much and. Is that just harder to get the data for versus when you have a nice clean Lake Anna that's just completely contained? Is it harder to get consistent data for fish populations like you were talking about on a river system? I think that they both have their challenges. Um, with the river, this year was an incredible challenge to sample. You know, we, I just finished up working up the, the fall data this year and the catch rate went down despite the fact that fishing on the South Fork is fantastic. Hmm. The reason it went down is because the water is so clear that you can literally see the smallmouth running away from the shock boat. Oh, and right. if there's yeah, nothing to hold them, they're they're just going to keep running and running and running. And there's certain sites that are one of our, some of our high catch rate sites, like you know, I'll just White House is a good example, where we go upstream, you know, close to a mile to complete our sample, and we couldn't reach the mm. most upstream point of that site, which has the most fish. Hmm. And so that's going to, you know, artificially deflate your your catch rate. Regardless, you know, the the overall sample looked good. We still were able to get a decent sample. You know, it was lower than the past two years, but it's still within that range of, you know, kind of the long term average. And it's still higher than, you know, back when, you know, we were sampling in the early mm -hmm. 2000s and stuff like that. So the river's in great shape. I'm not worried about it. Um, a lot of the the numbers we just have to kind of put an asterisk next to and, and just say look it was a record drought year yeah we're just not going to be able to get mm -hmm. a, a real great sample it's not something that we're strangers to we usually have clear water you know during during the fall um, but we're able to get around to some different parts of the sites that we weren't able to this time the fact you're visually seeing them too is encouraging because yeah. i remember there was years too you wouldn't you wouldn't see that and it's like mm -hmm. like they're not there it tortures our netters yeah. you know they're just like there's the big one get it you know i'm just like <laughs> there's, there's i mean you can, yeah. we wheel around we try to chase right. them we don't get them yeah. it just they just they see us coming I'll, i will say just a couple highlights we're kind of skipping around but no, that's fine it's, that's it's good that's, that's what the, the way yeah, it goes yeah, yeah. that's yeah. what the power of editing is guys yeah. this will look amazing in post that's right <laughs> um the sunfish are back Oh, that's the good. sunfish look amazing on on the South Fork and and on the main stem. Um, you know the the size of sunfish hasn't looked this good since before the the big fish kills back in the early two thousands. And so it's I'm I'm just I'm really pleased to see our native sunfish um, coming back, and I, I think people should really take advantage of it, especially on the main stem now that we have flathead catfish on there. They're well established. They they're spawning. Um, you know, it's it's going to be a challenging next 15, 20 years as as the, the river shifts with that yeah. that new species in there, which was illegally stocked. When I, I've heard I've had Travis Eden, Kingfisher guide. I've had a couple of guides on all year and there's been rumors of flathead and stuff. And, you know, just that you've now confirmed that there are flathead. Uh, my heart drops a little bit because I've I've transplanted to Williamsport uh, around Dam Four Down Five, and my God, there's no bluegill. Yeah, <laughs> there's just these massive, massive flatheads now. It's a problem, and I'm terrified for the main stem. Um, 
is there anything protocol wise people can do um, if they see flatheads or is it just it is what it is now? Unfortunately, you know, it, it, it just is what it is now. You know, that now that they're that we've documented that they are reproducing, you know, they're spreading throughout the main stem. Uh, originally, we caught one up at the Warren Dam site where we where we sample up there. And then some anglers reported some fish that were around the same size or about 24, 25 inches in the pool below that down near Morgan's Ford. And so I knew it wasn't a one, a one off incident, you mm -hmm. know, and, and they were either stocked at that size or we never found the, the original pair, or whatever the case may be. But now we have young of the year uh, captured all the way down to Barry's Ferry Route 50. Damn. And so they seem to be, we didn't get any at Locks Landing, but I was up in a lot of the shallower areas of Locks Landing. So I didn't get down into the main pool. I wouldn't be surprised if, if they were down there as well. Um, I did have a message into West Virginia DNR to see if they had any documented down in the lower part of the Shenandoah before you get to Millvale and just kind of a heads up to them if they mm -hmm, don't like mm -hmm. they're coming um it, so it's funny like how many people complain about the dams on these rivers like from the show in my mm -hmm. comment section but millville and riverton like how Almost much protected. were they were how much mm -hmm. did they actually protect and mm -hmm. slow down mm -hmm. the advancement of flatheads and snakeheads yeah. in the river i mean i don't think you could know but i've always wondered yeah. that without millville there to block the right. flathead that's right this it kind of contains worse. it yeah yeah it's kind of like the mountains with weather patterns here in the yeah. valley too and 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 i think I know the Susquehanna, they talk about how traditional smallmouth holes have been overtaken by the flathead. Now, I'm, uh, I guess my hope, too, would be that if you have a good balance where uh, smallmouth are aggressive eaters, kind of dog-eat-dog -dog world, like if, if you're, if I'm guessing, if the health of the smallmouth is good and, the, yeah. and they can kind of, you know, coexist or keep the population down, I guess what I'm trying to say, but if it goes out of balance, then yes, then, you know, the big cats, they're going to be eating, eating them as well, but... I don't know. Well, it, I guess wait and see. You know, like you said, you just have to wait and see what what right. the effect is. Yeah, we we will be collecting, you know, flatheads from from now on during our fall mm -hmm. sampling, so we can kind of track, mm -hmm. you know, their growth through time. Um, you know, I'm also interested in how the channel catfish, you know, are potentially mm -hmm. displaced. You know, because we have a f tremendous channel catfish mm -hmm. fishery in in the main stem. I think oftentimes it's overlooked, you know, because of the PCB mm -hmm. and the mercury, you mm -hmm. know, advisories on it, which is unfortunate, but I think people still enjoy it. And so I, I wonder right. if there'll be any type of, not necessarily, I mean, flatheads are, they're like, you know, trash compactors. They're going to, they're opportunistic. Yeah, they're going to yeah. eat what, what Whatever comes by it, them. Yeah. I don't know if they're, you know, going to be potentially just consuming the, the channel cats, but they might just be displacing them in some way, either just because of, you know, food or, um, just space or whatever the case may now, be. I saw one of your old things on the new river where you were taking musky and, and I don't know the procedure where you're going to run water down and it's going to regurgitate whatever's in their stomach. Is yeah. that something that you guys will do too, to, to kind of see what they are eating or we, we could do that. Um, you know, the, the Shenandoah is not that dissimilar as far as the fish assemblage goes mm -hmm. with other rivers. Uh, I would I would say that that would be a lower priority mm -hmm. um, on our list. I do you know wonder about the walleye potentially. Mm. Um, I you know because it's so new. You know I haven't worked with flatheads mm -hmm. except for when I you know travel around the state right. maybe once or twice a year. So personally, I need to educate myself a little bit mm -hmm. more about their habits mm -hmm. and and try to think critically about mm -hmm. what the potential impacts could be besides just the mm -hmm. sunfish. Like we, yeah. we all know that the sunfish are gonna mm -hmm. suffer from this, but we do have a, an up and coming walleye fishery, which is a bright spot mm -hmm. on, the, on the Shenandoah right now. Yeah. And uh, the, in, in the summertime, they're gonna be inhabiting those deep holes together. <laughs> and right, so right. luckily the walleye grow very fast very in the Shenandoah. Big, yeah. So hopefully they'll outgrow uh, the, the, the flatheads. The ones that we've caught so far, they're not that big. And so I don't know what the top end growth is going to look like until, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of years down the road from now for mm -hmm. the flatheads. But for now, a lot of the big smallmouth and a lot of the big walleye, you know, are going to be too big yeah, for, for these smaller, around, yeah. like 24 inch flatheads mm -hmm. to, um, to, to scarf. Mm -hmm. But, um, time will tell. I mean, mm -hmm. I can't imagine that these, these flatheads aren't going to grow big. Yeah. I, I just think they will. Yeah. I mean, cause the muskies do too, though. I mean, the muskies have grown big. And yep. they're, they're kind mm -hmm. of the same type of 
predator top end predator yeah, i think same you know, kind of but, it's, level. Mm-hmm. You but know. if you base on the statistics though it's like i i've always made the analogy the the, the blue cats and the flathead are, are, are like feral pigs mm-hmm. like the amount mm-hmm. they can breed and take over right. compared to at least based on what what you guys True. have told me about musky they just that's not in their mm-hmm. nature as a species to mm-hmm. have this like almost pig bomb effect mm-hmm. where there's a thousand per area where a small mouth aren't laying as many eggs and no. won't produce won't be able to keep up at the same yeah. Same rate but of what class. I've seen and what's come up on the Black Bass Advisory Board is it's not the catfish as much as also the angler because what do you use for flathead? Live bluegill. bluegill. Mm-hmm. And what I've seen a ton of on the Upper Potomac are guys with buckets and cast nets and they're catching bluegill to use as bait. Mm-hmm. And so now you've just, how much have you multiplied the issue because of just that there? And it's it's a problem an and yeah. I don't, there's nothing we can, we can't fix it today, but mm. that is, it is an issue. Um, it, it really is. Uh, but on that depressing note, I want to get back to something more positive, <laughs> which is with the smallmouth. What is we had um, John Mullican on for the Maryland Department, and they talked about their idea, them creating a smallmouth fish hatchery, and that it's hard as hell to raise a smallmouth. Mm-hmm. Why is it hard to raise a smallmouth? <laughs> well, certain fish species you can physically extract the eggs and the milt from the fish. Uh, musky are one of those walleye are one of those all of our trout species that we raise are one of those as well uh, with smallmouth you have to let them do their thing and so you have to play the right music and create the right <laughs> situation so they're <laughs> happy <laughs> and we're trying to figure out what makes uh-huh. them happy uh, what doesn't make them happy is a, an immune compromised fish going into a stressful environment which you know any type of change of environment is going to be stressful but that's what we experienced this year with with the, the front royal fish. We put the South Fork fish into those raceways and they started breaking out into lesions and and dying. And we had uh, a lot of mortality, way more than we expected. And the only thing I can think is huh. we, we know these fish are immune compromised. We know they're on that tipping point. And when the stars align and we get that the right flow, you know, the right runoff event, the, they they succumb to bacterial infections and and uh, immune system issues, and so the only thing I can think is when we brought them into the hatchery, that kind of mirrored that situation. It put them over that tipping point, and so they weren't able to do very well. Now a few of them did spawn. We had you know males, you know the sur- the survivors. They made nests. Uh, they were able to um, raise five thousand fry. and so those went into one pond. That was just off one nest. There were three oh, nests. Wow. But two of the nests, you know, basically they they lay their eggs into these nests. They continue to fan the nest and care for them, keeping fresh oxygenated water going over those eggs. And the eggs kind of sink down into the rocks and then the fry come out of the rocks. And you just have to go out there and check every day and look for the little black fry on this pile of rocks. And then you have to go in there and manually net them Mm. off of the nest. Very labor labor intensive. intensive. Mm. Very. And so... Wayne told me that he was, you know, in a meeting, Matt went out and checked the nest. Three of them had black fry on them. One was coming off. They went back in to finish up the meeting to let the others come off, went back out. Two of the nests disappeared, gone. That's not normal at all. Don't know where they went. One nest remained. They were able to collect that fry. You know, there was, there was 5,000 fry on there estimated. And so they went into one of the, one of the line ponds. Uh, and that was all we had because the Mari fish didn't spawn at all. Really? Now it's a little different in the, remember the Mari fish are in the harvest pavilion. Um, the water from the harvest pavilion is coming directly from passage Creek. There's no warm up time. Remember all the way back past the blisteringly hot summer that we had, it was a cold spring, a late cold spring. And the water temperature necessary for spawning is you know in the mid 60s you know for for smallmouth bass we did not receive that temperature in the harvest pavilion until maybe the very end where we were just like time to give up on these fish they're not spawning and so with the raceways there's time for it to warm up it has to travel a longer distance and we get warmer water in those concrete raceways where the shenandoah fish were so it seems, again, this is why we, we experiment this year. Mm-hmm. The Harvest Pavilion is not suitable. Unless we get a really warm spring and Passage Creek warms up quick enough, the Harvest Pavilion is just not going to work very well for, for raising these fish, which is fine. The concrete raceways will work. They've worked in the past. We're not going to use Shenandoah fish ever again. They're just not suitable for this. And so we're going to change things up for next year. But before we get to that, 
how do we fill out the rest of this hatchery? Because 5,000 fry, they could have went into the ponds and then 100 come out. We didn't know what was going to happen mm -hmm. when we put them in there. All we have is bad memories of the, of the mud ponds. And so the only idea I had was to collect fish from the wild because we needed to meet our allocation, which was uh, around 11,000 fish for the uh, a t total for both the South Fork and the South River. And so we, we knew the fish on the river were spawning. And so we did a float from Elkton to Shenandoah. And believe it or not, back in the 60s, Eugene Serber, who was kind of the father of, you know, smallmouth studies and biology and research, he, w he worked on the Shenandoah River and published a lot of papers about smallmouth spawning. And you can still mm. find it. You can look it up online and stuff like that. It's a really interesting read. And he used this cool bucket sucker. <laughs> Huh. And so he went along oh. the the Shenandoah River and he would count nests on, on specific floats, smallmouth nests, and he would push the bucket down in the water with a hose attached to it. And the, the pressure that would that would generate from that the bucket created a vacuum. And so he could use the hose to suck up the fry right off the nest. Wow. And then he would put them into a pan and he would enumerate the fry in the pan. And then he was able to determine the average amount of fry that we would find on the nest and also determine the number of nests per mile within a specific reach of the main stem, the North Fork and the South Fork. And so we went old school and we floated uh, so Elkton cool. to Shenandoah. That's so cool. I was actually doing a creel survey that day. That was another reason why this was so busy this summer where we were interviewing anglers mm -hmm. and I took the bucket. We not that one. I, man, I looked, for, I looked for the original. <laughs> this was in the, it, it's this was in the '60s. You're saying? This yeah, was this, was, this happened in the '60s. That's wow. Crazy. So I, I'm. We made our own bucket sucker, and we're just like, we'll just try it. We'll see. If it's getting it's getting late. We don't even know if there's going to be any nests out there. Um, huh, and so awesome. the water was pretty clear. We started going down. There went a smallmouth out from the bank, and we went over there. Sure enough, there's a nest right there, and I can see the fry on it. And so we get the bucket sucker. And we, my buddy, my technician, he pushes the bucket down. I start siphoning. I'm like, "Is it working?" He's like, "They're coming into the bucket." I'm like, "Okay, good." That's freaking cool. And so, I, you know, I'm like, "How many are in there?" He's like, "I don't know. It's a, a bunch. Like, there's so they're so tiny. Like, it's hard to tell." And so we we brought everything we needed. We had a cooler. You know, we put them in the cooler with some water and they looked fine. They're, you know, not really swimming around. They just kind of lay there. They wiggle a little bit because they still have their yolk sacs. So I call Wayne up and I'm like, Wayne, we're getting some fry for you. Do you want them? And this is, like, of course, on a Friday. It's always on a Friday. And he's like, he's like, yeah. He's like, how many? I'm like, I don't know, man. I mean, it looks like a lot. The, the cooler, you know, I, we just got one. So let me go down the river a little bit. And let's see how many more we get. Start going down the river more. You know, and, and this is this is common. You see, you know, multiple pairs kind of paired up along the along the bank. And at this point, they're not paired up anymore. It's either males or the male is off feeding or we've spooked them and we just haven't seen them. Mm -hmm. And the nest is just there with black fry on it. And so we start getting in this rhythm and we're we're taking these fry. And, you know, we we know that we don't want to overdo it because we don't want to hurt the, mm -hmm. the wild population. But mm -hmm. we knew that we needed to experiment with the hatchery we needed to put something in these ponds and try to meet our allocation mm -hmm. and the way i viewed it was we were kind of robbing peter to pay paul like mm -hmm. this section of river you know might be a little bit lower in the young of the year production but the section the section that we were floating is a very productive section anyway it's in the upper south fork there's lots of fish there so i wasn't overly concerned with with robbing a few of these nests that were down through there mm -hmm. and so we ended up doing very well uh, we we uh, met Wayne at the Shenandoah boat landing, handed off the fry, off you go to the hatchery. Who knows if they can handle the, the journey, you know, who knows what will happen. But we ended up getting nine, an estimated 9,000 fry wow. on that trip. And then I think it was a holiday weekend and we planned on going out again the next week. Uh, but things happen pretty quick. These fish, they develop quick. It doesn't take very long, you know, maybe like 10 days and they're starting to swim up and they're moving off the nest. Hmm. And so we went to the Mari River with the hope that it'd be a little cooler there and that they would be delayed. We were incorrect. Hmm. They were uh, very well along. Um, maybe you guys have seen them in the springtime. If you go into a backwater, they're just like, you know, three eighths of an inch, like specks, like mm -hmm. little guppies almost. Mm -hmm. They look like, uh, um, 
like baby sword tails. Mm. If you've ever seen those, like black sword tails in a pet shop. They're in the, they're just all over the backwater areas. Um, and so, you know, there's no point in hand netting those, those fry. They're just, they're too mobile and they're, they're too spread out. But we did find our, our other technician, Allison, found one nest on, on the whole float. And we used that nest. Um, we, we captured that nest with just aquarium nets because hmm. they were up, up off the, they were just kind of in a ball and we were just able to scoop them, scoop them, scoop them. Mm-hmm. And so we were able to get, what were the numbers on that? I think it was. And that's interesting though. So 5,000. Like, yeah. No, sorry. About around 2000 for, um, for, from the Mari. And that's interesting though. Like why the Mari was picked was it was getting the favorable conditions to hopefully find some, right. some, the, okay. That makes a lot more sense. And then now. the next day we went even further upstream on the South Fork, just, you know, to try, you know, between Port Republic and Island Ford, same kind of thing, too far gone. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they were already, there was loads of them, they were everywhere, mm-hmm. but they were all just that three eighths of an inch size dispersed. Mm-hmm. It was, there was, you can catch them, but you'll catch like 10 with one scoop where you used to catch 200 with one scoop. Mm-hmm. So lesson learned there. Um, it was, that that is not our plan going forward. Mm-hmm. You know, if we need to do that, you know, okay, we might be able to do that in certain situations, but you know, we, we don't want to get into that, that habit of, of going out and, and collecting fry from the wild. We want the brood fish to produce and going forward. I think we have a plan that, that, that will work for that. But, um, I think people understand too on that. Like I can see both sides of that where some guys are going to say, Oh, you're taking out the mm-hmm. future. But at the same time, if you get that wrong flood at the wrong time and you've blown that out anyway, you have a total loss, none, zero, class of that year and that's mm-hmm. what you guys have enough data to be able to show bad floods at the wrong time or low water kelby always talks about too low water but in other words it's, too it's, that the other side of this is you in certain years you might save a, a year class by doing said thing now we can't predict the weather no. or know what that's going to be but having that you know balance you know you can and back to what you said about supplement this is this is an interesting thing that you guys are doing that and i remember maryland you said too maryland it took them two to three years of persistence Mm -hmm. to about like year three they finally got over the hump and really had you know started having success but Mm -hmm. they didn't quit at the first failure so anyway i think i think it's fascinating Mm -hmm. and that's what uh odenkirk found and scott smith some of our biologists uh uh, years ago is that smallmouth have the Goldilocks syndrome as they mm-hmm. call it. It can't be too high water. It yep. can't be too low water. And that's what we experienced this yep. year, too low water. It was not a good spawn. Right. You know, we, we weren't catching them during the fall during our samples. Uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's definitely below average as far mm-hmm. as a spawn goes, but you, you know, you keep those, those fry in the mm-hmm. hatchery and, and you kind of protect them yeah. from those, yep. you know, serious, uh, mm-hmm. those extremes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've had some young of the year on the, on the, on the main stem and the South Fork and the North Fork that have shown mm-hmm. lesions and different types of uh, immune system issues. We're still waiting on some data from USGS from the work we did this spring or this summer with that. Mm-hmm. But my hope is that maybe we can keep them in the hatchery and keep them protected mm-hmm. during that early life stage stressful mm-hmm. time frame. Mm-hmm. And then when we release them into the wild, maybe they're over that hump mm-hmm. or maybe the contaminants they, they would have, mm-hmm. um, absorbed mm-hmm. you know maybe they don't absorb it as quickly and they're able to to yeah. get past and that, that year is not stress. a total loss mm-hmm. i mean you're going to get a percentage at least within of that stocked yeah, that, area yes. of the stream yep. yeah um so yeah maryland for the last couple of years have been running a tournament out of brunswick to help mm-hmm. cre- find be able, to be able to get their brood stock mm-hmm. is that something that your department has considered on in the future doing something like that a, a tournament and then you guys can actually pick pick whichever ones you want to take or what is your plans for the future? Yes. The, uh, w- we've talked with Maryland a bunch. I, I've, I've spoken with a number of hatcheries along the East coast, just kind of gleaning ideas from hatcheries that actually produce smallmouth. And Maryland was, was one of the, the, the better ones. And, um, South Carolina actually has a hatchery really that produces smallmouth hmm. shocking, but they're really good at it. The, the hatchery manager down there has been producing fish for 20 years and wow. they have it down. They produce wow. a pretty good number of, I of smallmouth. What part of South Carolina? Yeah, never is there a I'm not going to be able to pull it off the top of my no, head. You're fine. Honest. That's fine. Um, that is it, interesting. It is. That's yeah. not known as a smallmouth. I, I don't, I don't think there's no. very many 
rivers that that they actually use the smallmouth for. In fact, I think they overproduce on a pretty annual basis because they just wow. They, there's just not that many resources that can that can you know, that they can survive in. Huh. But they are wealth of knowledge, and so um, we have thought about the tournament thing. The problem with the tournaments are you got to keep those fish in the hatchery for a long time because a lot of the tournaments at Riverton, for example, mm -hmm. they're they're coming in March yes. and I don't want to keep fish in the hatchery that long. I don't want to feed them that long. I don't want them to be stressed that long. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to bump up, bump our, our brood collection to later uh, in the spring, closer to uh, mid to late April rather than end of March like this year. We don't really have a problem collecting the brood fish. You know, we, I'm going to get some help this year. Odenkirk and Eisel and, and Robbie Willis over the mountain, they're going to help with um, bringing some fish from the Rappahannock. And I think it's going to be the Rappahannock if it ever gets water again. And then we're going to use the Mari River again. Um, and then Lake Moomaw if if necessary. That's that's interesting. And so the the plan for next year, here's some shots real quick of, of us harvesting these these fish. Yeah, let's let's we'll jump back real quick. So we put these fry into the ponds, you know, 1200 go in, or a 2000 go into one pond, 5000 in another and then 9000 in the final one. And then when you drain these ponds down, they have this U-shaped uh, catch basin where all the fit, all the water drains down. Now in our old ponds, there'd be puddles over here, puddles over there, and you'd have to go and try to hand dip fish out of vegetation. There's no vegetation in these line ponds. They drain right into the U-shaped cauldron. And then we just take a seine and you have a perfectly clean sample of smallmouth bass. And so our results were in the 2000 fish from the Mari River, we basically got them all. Now, granted, it's hard to enumerate very small, you know, fry. You know, we do our best to, to take a sample and enumerate them. So we probably got more than 2000 fish from the Mari, but we, we, we got almost 2000 out of it. So that was a pretty good pull. The, the Front Royal Raceway fish from the Shenandoah was not as great. We got 2,000 of the 5,000 fish that were put in there. Not exactly sure why. There was a good zooplankton bloom, fairy <clears throat> shrimp. They looked healthy. All these fish looked, you know, extremely fat and healthy when we pulled them out. Um, that's just aquaculture for you. Sometimes you just mm -hmm. don't get them all out. And then from the, the fish dipped from the South Fork, we got the same thing, eight, you know, 8,434 fish out of the 9,000 that we put in there. Probably closer to ten or fifteen thousand when we put in there initially, but maybe not. Maybe they just survived that well. Again, this is just one sample point from from this time. Once we harvest these fish from these ponds, and again, they're they're in in these ponds. They're eating both zooplankton and a tiny little freshwater fairy shrimp. Hmm. Um, you can look them up. They're they're kind of cool looking critters. They they eat zooplankton as well. Sometimes they're a real pain for hatchery workers, but in this case, they are great for you know, a mid-sized huh. fingerling uh, smallmouth bass of phase one. Hmm. Once we pulled them out, we have to mark these fish. So we do that because we have to discern between a wild fish and a stocked fish when we put them out. You can't tag a tiny little smallmouth bass. It's way too much stress on them. And so we were going to use parental genetics initially. So we took fin clips from each potential parent brood fish that we put into the hatchery with the hope of running those genetics later on against one year old recaps out in the wild that we would take a fin clip from. So we could actually tell this fish in my hand right now, name which parent is it from? Is it the Mari River parent? Is it the South Fork parent? And they could actually say it's A1 and A2 spawned that fish. How, it is a stock fish. How many clips? Uh, there's a fin clip from the brood fish. Yeah, how many brood clip clips did you have to like? Oh, get? it's every fish. Which is again for the audience. It was 150. At home. My God. Okay. That's not that many. But I mean, we we clip 30,000 uh, trout sometimes. But so. but the fact <laughs> is, that I, I really hope for the people listening and watching on YouTube, like this is a shit ton of work it that is. goes in there for yep. somebody to catch one damn smallmouth. Mm -hmm. And I don't think when you pull up yeah, to the river no, right. and you grab the fish and then you start bitching, do you mm -hmm. realize like everything <clears throat> that had to happen mm -hmm. years in advance for that one thing to be mm -hmm. positive? It just you know keep put put everything in perspective. Yeah, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, especially if somebody catches that, you know, that trophy size smallmouth bass that was stocked that, you know, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years from now, that would be that's, that, that's just special. Yeah. A lot of work went into that fish. So with the parental genetics, that is the plan going forward. Um, but we couldn't use parental genetics this time because we collected fish from the river. 
we didn't have fin clips from the parents of the fry that we sucked off the nests. Ah. So how do you tell if it's a stock fish or a wild fish? We use something called oxytetracycline, which is a, an antibiotic that's used in aquaculture and used in agriculture and everything else. And you dip the fish into a certain ratio of this OTC, which you can see on the left if you're on YouTube. So dying um, otoliths, so to speak. Yes, it's dying yeah. otoliths. And so you can see the, the blazes to the right there in green that show up. And you can then sacrifice the fish down the road and look for the blaze on that otolith. And so that's how you know it's a stocked fish. You have to sacrifice the fish to do it though. So that's kind of counterproductive. So we would just take a sample of the one-year-old fish mm -hmm. next year hmm. within the stock sections and look for that those blazes. And I'm excited this year <clears throat> because we just got our results back. All the control fish we sent down to our lab to look at, uh, look whether the OTC mark showed up. That's the scary part because we put all the fish out there in June and we don't even know if the OTC took or not because it's yeah. a little bit of voodoo with that sometimes too with water chemistry and the amount of time that they're in the, the bath and stuff like that. Um, but we just got that back and we got 100% on the on the OTC mark, which is fantastic. They said it was a little bit faint, um, but um, they sh it should be okay. And so in 2024, in the fall, within the South Fork site, which is Newport to White House, we will take a sample of, you know, approximately 100 one-year-old sized fish and look for the OTC blaze. Same with the South River site. We'll look, you know, for those one-year-old fish and look for the OTC blaze. And that will give us a percentage of contribution to the to the population within the river. And we can say that hopefully 20% of our stock mm -hmm. fish are contributing to the population within the mm -hmm. South Fork. That would be a very large contribution. Mm -hmm. That's our goal, but that would be a very large contribution. Your goal, just to clarify, is you wanna see a 20% next year or 20% in five years that 20% for age one. For age one? Yeah, because okay. we, we consider them fully recruited to the fishery. They're past the, the early life, young of the year stage, you know, that that is so predation heavy. They can still be predated upon, of course, mm -hmm. when they're, you know, five, six inches. But, you know, they're, they're a part of the population at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the goal. And then hopefully that will then translate into an increase in angling um mm -hmm. catchability as well mm -hmm. or catch rate and to to measure that we did a krill survey this year uh before we have all these stocked fish within these sections and then we'll do a, a krill survey in 27 28 somewhere in that time frame and we'll see if the catch rate within those study sections have changed mm -hmm. um and so hopefully we'll, we'll be able to make a difference i think it will i mean i think supplemental stocking is i mean we're seeing it lake holiday and again we don't have the techniques you have and we're not you know testing genetically testing them but just and we're not putting in the numbers that we need for that mass of water but we're it's cool well we did walleye too walleye we're, we're never in that water mm -hmm. and we're seeing like i think it's probably five or six years later we're looking at uh 20 plus no more than that it's close 20 24 25 26 inch walleye Good. so i mean that's we're seeing you know and that's cool because they were never in there before but yeah um, and you don't always know, but we're funny cause we'll, we'll catch that one and, and we're asking ourselves the same one. Well, that's too small for the stock ones, you know, mm -hmm. and so you know, that's a natural one versus, but any way you look at it, you're catching. And like you said, you're seeing catch rates and there's nothing better when you hear people say, oh yeah, I've caught, you know, four or five small mouth and you know, three of them are, you know, 16 inches or whatever. And it's kind of like, well, that's cool. You know? Yeah. Uh, you know that that supplement supplement is, is, is helping. So. And, but, and there's so many, <laughs> So you do have to break this apart where it's like, first, does it work? Yes. And then how much does it cost to make it work? Yes. And then you can kind of go from there. But I think I think the big gorilla in the room, and I, I know, guys, some of you will enjoy how much I'm covering the Alabama spotted bass issue. But, you know, when you're talking to, um, you know, Mr. Bernarski mm -hmm. and Odenkirk, and I just interviewed an episode with the guy that runs Clemson University who actually headed mm -hmm. all those papers. I have that in the works, too. Uh, they're a problem. And I'm also... If they're going to completely render smallmouth extinct in some places, do we have an obligation to then do supplemental stocking of smallmouth to keep them in the rivers? And this is more of a, you know, a big flimsy question, but it's like if you can't get an Alabama bass, let's say out of a river system, that's going to do destruction. Does that mean supplemental stocking is something that has to be done to keep smallmouth there? Because spotted bass will, in theory, or Alabama bass, apologies, 
will create an issue for them in the long run. You know, you I know. guess it's expensive because I was thinking too. I know our guy, Kent Hatcher, guy came out of Ohio, and of course, listening to him, he's pulling fish from all over the country, right? So he's he's got different people that he's you know getting this here and that there. You guys better be careful. <laughs> well, I mean, we did we did go through the state and saying that we were, we're getting signed documentation. And I'm not quite sure. You might but specify. But are they pure smallmouth? That's the if he's getting them from all over the place. So the, right. the reason I ask or I say that is because we are taking precautions mm -hmm. uh, to to try to prevent it. Um, we will get we will be testing all the smallmouth bass this year uh, for Alabama bass genetics that come yeah. into the hatchery. And mm -hmm. so we'll be taking two fin clips. So, you know, 300 fin clips instead of 150 this time. Uh, and so we'll, we'll test and make sure. And if, and if we do have Alabama bass genetics, we'll have the lots separated. So we know this pond can't get stocked. Uh, and then we'll also know that we have Alabama bass genetics in this system, you know, cause the Mari, right. the Rappahannock and the Shenandoah and Lake Muma, they're, they're all clean to the best of our knowledge. We, right. We've tested some of those, uh, systems for Alabama bass genetics. But we most certainly don't want to introduce Alabama bass mm -hmm. genetics into the Shenandoah yes. or South River. The reason we didn't test them last year or we didn't need to is because we had, you know, the Mari River um, is a clean river. And then the Shenandoah River is a clean river, too. And we're putting them into the Shenandoah. So it's, you know, you're taking brood out and putting the, the fry right back in. So even if we had a, a tainted fish, which is, it, I mean, it's possible um we would we it would just be right. right back into the system where it came from we're not moving alabama bass genetics right. around but that was that was last year from now on you know because we're bringing brood in from different systems mm -hmm. we'll be we'll be testing each individual parent uh to make sure that there is no genetics there yeah, and clarify too i mean we're getting crappy and, and walleye so i think the smallmouth and he's a, he's second or third generation so he knows where he's getting them from it's not like he's collecting from a but the other, my question was too, like Erie, we got a lot of guys going up to Erie. And so is there any cross state type of like, hmm. what's fascinating for me too, is you go to some of these places, like the smallmouth is not a necessarily desired species that they're, they're targeting as anglers. Like they're going to walleye and, and different, different things. And so, but our guys that love smallmouth are going to these Niagara and different so places. So the genetics from the Susky, is it, is like it possible like to do the same sort of thing, but instead hmm. of taking, I don't know, I'm not I'm just, and I know that'd be expensive too, because you know, is, and then you have a lot of other things like you're talking about the health of it, but I don't know. It's just, it is, it's to me, again, it's fascinating when we think about the smallmouth bass and how, how insane we are about that. I bet that there's species. a shit ton of red tape. <laughs> I'm sure it would be. Crawl, yeah. it's, it, it is. Yeah. <laughs> we have pretty strict biosecurity policies. Mm -hmm. it, it hasn't always been that way. And then with the private sector, it's it's not that way. You know, right. uh, we, we do have to approve mm -hmm. stockings Correct. in certain waters. But, you know, with these private hatcheries, you know, we don't have control over their yes. health reports. So to well, speak. you said we were like we have to sign off on a health report or health. You know, mm -hmm. you get signed off that there's documentation that they are free to for free of disease right um, and and we and yeah we we need um basically we're in the same boat we need a, mm -hmm. a clean bill of health from the right. muskie that come from north carolina gotcha you know they're those are tested and they're actually raised on well water indoors so mm -hmm. pampered yeah they're pampered <laughs> mm -hmm. so yeah, there, there's not an issue there but we used to trade fish with you know different states and we would we would bring them them in without you know testing and those are those are the old days, you know. Now, it's it's much, it it presents a challenge because there was a lot of partners that we used to work with, you know, in different states that we just can't work with anymore, and so we've had to get creative and had to learn to raise some of our some fish in house if we could, or just bring them in at the egg stage or instead of you know at fingerling stage. You just there was there was ways around it to um, to keep us biosecure, uh, but also you know. Uh, complete some of the goals that we had and some of the objectives that we had. And back to what you're saying locally, this is just, this, I mean, I was so excited about this, like to know, cause you, like he said, you hear about it and you know, it's, it's in the works, but then to find out the specifics and knowing that it's right in your backyard and that it's, it's a, like the local fish mm -hmm. in the DMV, this is a local thing that you guys are doing. Hats off to you for taking the time and the resources. And, and now there was, there was money to correct from a, lawsuit i think that helped help with this or no is there 
like to help get this thing back up and going and right and yeah it, it was and, from the the settlement you know from the mercury contamination right. yeah uh so there was um I don't know the exact number that went into the hatchery, but it was multiple millions of dollars. Right. You know, I think it was upwards of up to 10, I think was the the agreed upon amount. And I'm not sure where they where they landed in that in that uh, range. Um, but um, but yeah, kind of getting back to the the end of this uh, presentation, we were able to uh, stock some fish into the South Fork. We, we met our, our allocation with 6,700 fish within that kilometer reach. Uh, it's 150 fish per kilometer and then uh, the south river uh, we were able to meet that as well at, at 4,000. and then we had some leftovers so you know the north fork's been struggling the past few years uh, ever since 2018 and so we stocked a few fish into the north fork shenandoah just over 1500 fish went within the deer rapids to strasburg area nice. and then hearthstone lake it was a lake in Augusta County. It was drained down by the Forest Service to fix the dam probably about five or six years ago. And we're starting to build that uh, up back up again. And we have some yellow perch in there. And we, our plans are to stock some smallmouth in that lake to create kind of a northern fishery. It's a, it's a mountain reservoir. And, you know, we wanted something different than just the, the bass, bluegill, catfish, trout, mm. you know, mix. And so we're hoping that maybe we can do a yellow perch, bluegill, mm -hmm. smallmouth, maybe, you know, pike or muskie. There used to be pike stocked in that mm -hmm. reservoir back in the day. When were they stocked and how big, how large? Which ones? The, the, the smallmouth? Smallmouth. The... They were, you know, probably about two to two and a half inches long and they were stocked, uh, I think, late June, I think was the time frame. Okay. I'm, everything's mixing together oh, now. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. More yeah. good information. What is your... Within reason, what is the perfect stocking size for a smallmouth? And then if money wasn't an objective, what is the perfect stocking size for a smallmouth? Well, if we could raise them to phase two, which is kind of like double the size of that, you know, up to like the four or five inch mark, that would be fantastic. But, you know, anytime you hold a fish for even longer, you got to you got to start feeding them minnows or they're going to start eating each other. They're, they're cannibals. And so the fear for us was if, you know, if we hold these fish too long they're going to start eating each other and you know maybe they run out of minnows and they get thin and so their survival goes down because of that reason as well because we see that with muskie sometimes too where there's an issue with the minnow shipment or the minnows didn't survive and then you end up with you know skinnier muskie and they're just you know they don't survive well on the mm -hmm. transport to the river um, they don't survive the drawdown of the pond well so and and minnows are very expensive and and we we are raising them on site now so we have the potential to to grow these fish out if need be but for me i would like to see how these phase one fish do as far as survival goes if we can make a difference with phase one that means we can raise a lot more fish that's true and then we can utilize them in other parts of the state mm -hmm. potentially mm -hmm. and so that's what i'd like to see rather than putting in that extra effort of going to phase two potentially um running into some roadblocks with you know minnows or water conditions or cannibalism or whatever the case may be you know you don't want to end up with you know 50 really well-fed smallmouth bass at the end of this you know at the end of the the, the rearing mm -hmm. season i don't think that would happen I, I think we would have enough minnows to to, to raise them for longer now but um, again, th there's going to be some attrition there and, and we're mm -hmm. not going to get as much. And it's, it's always that it, it's always that um, numbers versus pounds argument. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we're stocking. Well, our goal this year is to stock around 10 to 15,000 phase one to, to harvest about 10 to 15,000 phase one out of each pond. So that would take our 11,000 we raised last year and bump it to 40,000 fish plus. Wow. And we'd be, I'd be just thrilled if that was the case. Now, if we raise them to phase two and that dropped to 20,000 fish, if we are perfect and we raise 40,000, those fish are going to survive better because they're larger. Mm -hmm. But what works better? The 40,000 at a smaller right, size right. or the 20,000 at a larger size? Me, yeah. it's, it, mm -hmm. it's, you really can't know the answer to that, in my opinion, unless you experiment with it. And so down the road, we may experiment because the beauty of going and checking those age one fish every year from here on out, it'll be parental genetics. Mm. If we find in 2020 by 2025 that we're just not seeing these, these phase one fish, they're just disappearing. Then we're going to make an adjustment. 
And we'll try phase two. I, again, I just think this is all so fascinating when you get into the numbers because it is. It's like, it, it can quantity be a quality in of itself? Mm-hmm. And then it comes down to the budget because I've heard people complain before mm-hmm. in the comments section. And rightfully so, guys, please keep telling me what you would want to see and what your th- feeling of this is. Why don't you just stock a bunch of like, you know, 10 inch fish like the F1s? Why not stock mm-hmm. them when they're older? But then you don't understand the rabbit trail of time mm-hmm. and resources and stuff mm-hmm. to get that one fish. And is the juice worth the squeeze? I mean, mm-hmm. do you want 100 fish that are 12 inches long or do you stock 40,000? And in the mm-hmm. end, that's actually it's better. I don't know. It's just fascinating because there's until you run it all, you don't know. And mm-hmm. then you can kind of figure out even if this is if, if door B phase two is better. Is it so exorbitantly more expensive that even though it's better, it just doesn't make sense to mm-hmm. do. But yeah, you know. I, I think it's important to remember, too, that we we were stocking around the phase one size fish, you know, years ago when, when this was done the first time and they did contribute, you know, anywhere from like five to 15 percent was 15 percent was like the max that was on the Stanton River. Most of it was, you know, four or five, you know, 10 percent, something like that. So they do contribute. It's not it's not that, you know, oh, that's yeah, a big yeah, mystery. Yeah. yeah. Um, but. Every system is different. We weren't stocking the Shenandoah. The Shenandoah is going to be tricky just because it's already a very dense system as it is. It's not it's not the perfect situation as far as stocking goes, because mm-hmm. this, like I said before, the the Newport to White House stretch, you know, it's it's a great river. It's got a it has no problem with spawning. You know, it's very consistent. There's there's high numbers of smallmouth bass. And so why are we stocking there? It's because we have the data there. You know, if we stocked it. In a different river like the main stem which i'd love to to try some uh there as well we just don't have the population data like we do on the on the uh, south fork and so um we're we're interested to see how that how that all pans out the south river I, i'm more curious about the south river than i am about the south fork the south river does need supplemental stocking it, the, the population is lower than i'd like to see it right now and so i think we have a real chance of making a difference on that particular system and I'm hopeful that um, maybe we can work on the North Fork a little bit too, because uh, it, it definitely could use it. And that's the good news about what they're doing. Not just throwing the not they're not just throwing the fish in there and walking away from it. The fact that you're go- going back and number one, you have the baseline data. Number two, you're going to continue to study that. And that's the thing I don't think I don't think people understand about biologists too. They think that you live on the river all the time. Now you have, like you said, you have a period of time where you're on the water, but now you spend just as much, just like you're talking about editing, yeah. you spend more time in the office, crunching the numbers, getting the data, looking the data, evaluating the data and doing all these things that, you know, so there's that, that balancing act too. And that's what I think is intriguing about these guys is, is their knowledge, but also that scientific data type of mentality of let's let's test this let's run the numbers and see if what we're doing is working and then make adjustments thereafter after that so and you've got a strategic plan i think moving forward which i think is kind of cool you know trying to stay consistent with collecting data is so important you know we we collect our fall smallmouth data in the fall around the same time around the same temperature the same locations we try to make the water clarity the same. Mm-hmm. We try to make the water level the same. We can't control those factors. Mm-hmm. And eventually you just have to go, you know, right, when you can right, go. Right. Um, but it's, you know, w- there's not a lot of mixing and matching with the sites. We do the mm-hmm. same nine sites every year. We hit the mm-hmm. same damn rocks every year. Yeah. Um, so, th- you know, that's, that's, that's one thing where, you know, we have a pretty powerful and long-term data set you know, to look at. Uh, going back to, you know, kind of the late 90s, early 2000s with the Shenandoah. But the, the the exciting thing for me the past few years is because we're so regimented and going out at a certain time of year, when we when we went out to sample the young of the year smallmouth when they were um, having issues with, you know, lesions and fin rot and stuff like that and, and some morbidity on the South Fork, we had never... I had never in my career sampled that time of year. Pennsylvania does. They sample their young of the year with backpack shockers in the summertime. Huh. That's not the way we do it. We do it in the fall with, with electric fishing boats. And so just learning their behavior, where they like to hang out uh, in those early life stages uh, really helped educate us as to where we should be stocking these fish as well, what type of habitats we should be targeting um, and you know how much we should spread them out. And you know, on the South River, we didn't have as much fall data uh, on that particular stretch. And so we actually did 80 individual sites with canoes. We canoed down South River 
and we would stop and do 50 meters of the shoreline with backpack collector fishing units, collect all the young of the year smallmouth we'd find, and then go down, you know, to the next spot. It was it was somewhat stratified, but mostly it was kind of random. Just both both banks, we'd have two canoes, flipped a couple times with the backpack shocker. Never a good thing. <laughs> It was a lot of work, but we were able to, you know, to get a, an idea of what the spawning success was like on South River because we didn't have that data like we did on the South Fork Shenandoah and the main stem and the North Fork. And that helped us develop the stocking rate. So, again, going back to your point before, you know, the, the stocking rate, it's not it's not bulletproof statistically wise. You know, we, there there is always a little bit of voodoo with this stuff and we you have to kind of make a decision. Right. But we have a lot of data that we can that we can look look to to help us inform help inform us about uh, the the stocking rates that we choose and so forth. So we're not just it's not the old days, you know, of the the '60s and the '70s of like, oh, let's try this and throw it out there. And that's why it's so frustrating when we have an illegally stocked fish put into a system because so much time and effort goes into this. And yes, we have to cater to all different types of anglers, but when you're managing a system for specific species. And we add one, so much more thought and research goes into it than someone that's just like, I want this fish and throws it in there. Mm -hmm. And then it just has the potential to really blow it up. Is there food? Is you think there's enough as far as the uh, the habitat, not the habitat, but the forage? Is is there, let's say it in again, an ideal world, it does really see, you see it uh, tick up. Is Do you feel like the forage is there in the river for to sustain increased populations i'm assuming it would be i mean assumption but is that something you guys are looking for a at specific too? species or just say in, small just in general let's just say small um yeah. you know we have we we target game fish you know that's that's mm. what we're paid to do is to manage the game fish mm. obviously you know non-game fish as we as as they're mm. called um you know they they obviously matter as well and so Department of Environmental Quality does, you know, random sampling of, mm -hmm. of some of our streams and they they target all fish species that, mm -hmm. that uh, you know, that they're that they come by. Mm -hmm. And so we can lean on them for some of their non game data um, for us. You know, if we collected everything, we'd have so many shorthead red right. horses on the main right, stem, right. we'd overflow. Right. And so we really have to target, you know, specifically the the uh, the mm -hmm. smallmouth bass and the, and the game fish species. But with our depletions, that's why that data is so valuable. And th again, that's the the uh, the exercise where we line twelve boats across the river and gotcha. and push up through, <clears throat> and we collect everything. We have enough live wells and enough personnel gotcha. to handle it. And so I know from two thousand five or two thousand three till now, we have I think five different depletions on the South Fork Shenandoah River, and that means I have um, you know population levels for minnow species, sucker species, catfish species, you name it, uh, for all those, you know, different uh, years that we've done that sample. And so I can see over time how those populations change mm -hmm. and that can help us inform us on whether or not it can handle another predator species. Mm -hmm. gotcha. And and we can, you know, ramp back some of them. That That's that's always a tricky thing is when you, you put, you know, the walleye out there, you put the muskie right. out there, you know, you, you don't necessarily know whether they're going to take off and spawn right. on their own. We're very fortunate with the, the muskie and the walleye in our systems. They do spawn a little bit. The walleye I'm unsure about, and, you know, and, and I think it's still a little bit early. You know, we've, we've just we started stocking them back in 2019. I'm sure they'll get off a few spawns. But in most systems within Virginia, they need to be supplementally stocked. So I'm not necessarily concerned about them. With the muskie, they they do. We did we did a, some research back in uh, the 2010 to 2016 time frame where we were marking all of our stocked muskie that we put out, and we did find that a certain percentage were wild fish, but it wasn't enough to to sustain a population. And so, that's the perfect situation because if we ever get too dense with muskie, and I get and I see the sucker you know numbers drop, back off, you know, just pull it back. Um, the reason that we don't see muskies spawning so successfully is, is habitat. The Shenandoah is completely right. different than the James and the new, you know, we have a muskie pool and then we have a few miles of smallmouth water, limestone, bedrock, riffles, runs. They can move through that, but they don't hang there and they're not going to spawn there. Mm -hmm. And then you have another muskie pool. Gotcha. And so we have these isolated populations, these isolated pockets of fish and we have fish tagged. They move to and from those those pockets that go over dams 
all kinds of stuff. I'm mean, we're just getting the weeds, but at the Go Newport, for it. at the Newport that depletion, this is just so yeah. cool. The Newport <laughs> depletion, we caught a uh, 45 inch muskie, nice big female, good fish. Scanned it, had the tag, and I looked back in the data recently. We tagged that fish in 2010. Mm. We've recaptured it during our musky sampling, which is in the winter time. This is the ninth time we've recaptured that no fish. Way. It came from the town of Shenandoah, swam over the, the dam at Newport, and then resided in the Newport area. We recaptured it for the first time in that pool in 2016, and it's been there ever since. And so this was its ninth recapture. We, 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 in 2010, it was a two-year-old fish, so it was turning 14 this spring. Wow. Yeah. You see, and that's, that's, incredible. that's why when you hear the doc talk that it was the muskies that ruined the smallmouth yeah. fishery, I don't believe that. Don't when believe you look, when you think of the fish, like if you tagged a flathead and a muskie, yeah. what are the chances that you'll that's catch right. that same flathead compared that's to right. a muskie? It's just, it's a completely different cat yeah. when it comes to the ecosystem. And please, since we're in the weeds, please tell the story again. I think we did one at a time, but the two big muskies that you shocked up, that that story will never get old. Please tell that again. Like that was, <laughs> like how all that went down. Well, and, and the interesting thing is, you know, this was back, I believe it was in 2021. Uh, we we're all masked up. It's confusing time, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. not the not the most fun mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we worked through it and we worked in the field together and uh, we went to one of our sampling sites in Page, and uh, it was a pretty cold day. You know, we we were seeing some fish, uh, but but not too many. And on our last run, we had a big fish come up, and it came up next to my boat. I wish it would have came in my boat, but it didn't. You know, and with with electro fishing, especially with musky, if they come off the bottom, they come up late, mm -hmm. and so you got to hit it in reverse real fast mm -hmm. and just cross your fingers because you know the field is only so big on an electro fishing <sighs> boat. It only goes down about eight feet, mm -hmm. only about you know eight feet in diameter. And so when you're in 15 feet of water, you may not even touch a fish. Mm -hmm. And so this fish must have been suspended and it rolled up and it looked like, a, you know, <laughs> I don't know. It was so fat. Big, yeah, I mean, I, I see a lot of musky. I'm very fortunate in that yeah. with my work. And so when a big fish comes up, you know, I look over at my other driver and I'm like, that was a big fish. It's a big fish. Yeah. And so uh, this thing rolls up and I slam it in reverse. And the other boats, they they instinctively know that if you put it in reverse hard, something came up, it, it may come to any of the boats. And right. so they go in reverse as well. And so it, it ran over to the boat to my right. They got it in the net. They pulled it over the bow. The net snapped. Wow. Oh, my gosh. And then they got it. And I saw it. And it just, it was almost as big around as my torso. Wow. Just a monster fish. And so I said, I was like, that got to be a 50 and i'd never seen a 50 in, on the shenandoah i'd seen one or two in the james um but it would have been in the first 50 inch fish that we sampled you know every musky angler you talk to oh i caught a 50 i caught yeah, a 50 yeah. right mm -hmm. okay yeah um and you know they're out there yeah. obviously but i'd never seen one and so and I'll something like that's probably well not with their not with their rigs i'm going to say a lot of times that'll break off a, a smallmouth fisherman's mm -hmm. not going to land that either uh, right anyway, right anyway but go ahead uh, and there's, you know, there's a lot of musky anglers out there that are that are novice and they're just mm -hmm. getting started and, you know, they don't necessarily how to measure a fish mm -hmm. properly. And it is very difficult to measure these mm -hmm. fish. They're very heavy, very mm -hmm. slimy, very stinky, but mm -hmm. a good stink. And uh, so anyway, they, they, we got this fish in the boat and, and another big fish came in mm -hmm. earlier, but I didn't get a good look at it as well as, uh, you know, as well as the one that I saw come up next to me. And so we start working these fish up. And again, I'm just like, man, this thing's got to be a 50. It's so big. And there's a there's a twin in there, and I'm just like, dang, that thing's as, as big as the other one. <sighs> so we put it on the length board, and sure enough, 150 and three quarters, and 151 inch fish. Wow, just monster, mm. monster fish, and just so girthy. Like the, that's what I love about the South Fork fish. I don't care what you say, New River and James River biologists. Our fish are fatter, that's right. and prettier that's than right. your fish. Yeah, <laughs> and so. I bet he couldn't get the grin off his face. He's being, being a musky oh, guy, but that was yeah. like that was like Christmas for you, probably. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's just uh, incredible to see a specimen like that. Yeah. You know, we don't have, you know, we have great smallmouth fishing in the valley, but you know, we don't see a lot of trophy smallmouth. We don't have a lot of trophy largemouth right. bass. You know, trophy walleye, which you know is kind of a, a best kept secret right now until I just said it, and trophy musky. That's that's our thing. We've we've got we've got some really nice quality fish. Uh, in the Shenandoah system. So 
I'm thrilled to see to see those. And again, those fish, uh, one of was one for sure was a stocked fish. So I mean, again, it goes back to this is a fish that we placed, you know, mm -hmm. by net into the river, and now it's there for somebody to catch a fish of a lifetime. And we've uh, since then recaptured one of those two 50 inch fish. Really? Wow. Yeah. I didn't get the sister yet. I don't know if she, she may have gotten old, but, um, but yeah, we did get, uh, I don't know if it was last year, but it might've been the year before that. Uh, I think the, the year after we caught the twins, we caught, um, caught one That's of the two cool. the next year. So how does the muskie stocking program work for the state of Virginia with, with your role in the Valley? Cause you have, you know, you have the James, you have the new, you, you have the Shenandoah watershed. Mm -hmm. Um, is it, do you balance out the resources? Does each area get to be stocked or is it in a, like a rotation? Like how does all that work? We have a, a muskie committee. Um, I, I'm the lead of that currently, but we have a, a hmm. group of biologists and assistant biologists that, manage them the specific musky fisheries so the the big ones the james river and the new river but you know we're, we're divided into four regions and so the biologist that's in charge of that musky water is managing the smallmouth bass of the james the sunfish of the james all the game fish of the james including musky now um some special um you know, interest is put towards the musky fisheries that are that are real draws. Yeah. And so the New right. River and the James River and the Shenandoah, we specifically sample for musky, whereas the, the Lake Shenandoah, you know, we don't really sample specifically for musky on Lake Shenandoah. It's kind of a diversity fishery. And so we have a system developed where we have priority waters, you know, because the New River and the James River are the, the most dense fisheries in the state their priority A and priority B, if we ever needed to stock them. We do not need to stock them mm -hmm. right now. But the biologist has the option to ask for fish for those resources, and they are the highest priority if you would ask for them. They haven't asked for musky for those rivers for years. They don't need them. The Shenandoah is third in line there, and so we're, we're the third priority. And so at, by default, the South Fork is is basically the number one priority because okay, the New yeah. and the James, you know, are kind of off, off on the list, but off the list. There's no allocation for them. And then the main stem in the North Fork, you know, follows suit. And then we have more of the diversity fisheries, uh, which are called the B waters. And they're like Lake Burke, Lake Shenandoah, Royal Retreat, you know, some of those other ones. I won't rattle all of them off. And then we have the seawaters even further down that list where there's musky present, but they're either, you know, spawned in the wild somewhat, like the Jackson River the, uh, that comes into the James River. I don't know that they necessarily spawn in that river, but they run up there sometimes and there's resident populations. They're does, does, very small. Is that is that temperature suited for them year round, right? Because of the, the like Moomaw dumping into the Jackson? Yeah, it's okay. it's a cooler river. So they they enjoy um, where the cow pasture and the Jackson come together. You know, that's kind of a, a thermal refuge there for them. Um, you know, the cow pasture, the same thing. They'll, they'll fish will run up there, you know, in, in the spring to spawn and they kind of you know, mosey their way back. Some of them stay, some of them are residents. Um, but we, we just don't see a ton of the young fish up there. Um, when we do sample it, we don't sample the cow pasture a ton, but you know, if I, you know, for just for example, I'm not stocking the cow pasture, everybody calm down. But if I <laughs> wanted to stock the cow pasture, you know, that, that would be a seawater on the list and the allocation would go there. And if we were able to raise enough fish to reach the C level allocation, they would get stocked. Uh, more than likely, the A's and the B's would would eat up all the allocation, and uh, and the C's wouldn't get touched. And right now, we we don't have very we don't have any sea waters where biologists are asking for fish. However, if our new plans of bringing the fish to Front Royal pan out, we may have some more flexibility. And so maybe biologists that you know. We, we haven't had the best reputation of being able to raise a ton of musky uh, to the advanced fingerling size. And so if we are able to do that going forward, there may be some opportunities to at least consistently stock waters. You know, it's, it's been kind of hit or miss over the years. So it's really hard to develop a fishery yeah. that relies on stocking when you just can't stock it on a, on a consistent basis. And so my hope is that we can switch that around a little bit and then maybe we can uh, it stocks some some waters more consistently and then you know potentially uh, move to some of those sea waters an example is um, ragged mountain reservoir over in charlottesville that was put on the list 
a few years ago and we were able to stock uh, that a few times, uh, but it's further down the list and so it doesn't get it on a consistent basis. We've had some reports of people catching some fish there, so they are surviving, but you know, you need to stock it consistently yeah. to create a fishery there. And that would be a cool reservoir be really cool. because it's near an urban area. And that's part in, in our musky management plan. One of our goals is to have the br bring these fish to to, you know, more uh, urban concentrations. So people have the opportunity to go fish for a trophy fish like that. And they don't have to drive, you know, two hours to to go to the Shenandoah or something like that. And so Ragged Mountain would be kind of one of those situations where Charlottesville is right there. And, you know, it's not the uh, the best situation because you can't launch a boat there, but you can launch kayaks and canoes. And so the kayak anglers, I think, are they're they're, mm -hmm. they're dialed into it yeah. now. Um, some of the I think some of the guests on your show in the past know about it. They text me every now and then with a picture of a, a young muskie. So I'm hoping that maybe oh, this cool. winter they'll get into some of the three and four year olds. Um, that should be in there at this point and and maybe we'll we'll see what kind of size they they can uh, they can put on in that re particular resource is and one thing is, is that mm -hmm. committee a, a private thing or is that information open to the public uh, what the committee comes up with uh, everything we do is is open to the public you know so all you have to do is ask um you know as far as you mean like attending the, the oh, meeting or just a link you don't want to, to attend it, it. It's oh, not no, no, yeah yeah <laughs> Um, is there like a press release? Cause I'll just tell people where they can go to check out the press release from your meetings or when stuff about that's announced. No, typically we don't do any type of press releases for the meetings. Um, if, if you asked about what was discussed, you know, we'd put something together for you. Okay. Gotcha. But, you know, it's, it's not, it wouldn't be a huge priority. You know, it, we're, we're more focused on getting the information from the field work that we do out to the public. That's a big enough task as it is and hard enough to keep up with, you know, with like the website updates and stuff like that. Um, so I think the maybe the finished product would be more of interest to people than what we discuss, you know, internally. I know you'd be interested. Yeah, in <laughs> yeah, I will find that fascinating. Yeah. Um, and I really want to hit on the walleye, too, because I don't think we've given that enough justification. Holy crap, guys, there are some big ass walleye in the Shenandoah. How was that a happy accident that it took off like it did? Did you in your wildest dreams think they would take as well as they did to the Shenandoah River? Well, we, we had a little bit of a precursor because the Front Royal in, in its, you know, in the in the older setup, they raised walleye and they'll raise walleye again this year. You know, we'll double crop the ponds. We'll bring in walleye, fry, raise them in the ponds, harvest them, fill them back up so they're ready for smallmouth bass. And so the old system would leak fish like crazy. You, you know, take the boards out and you're drawing it down and there's basically a a giant toilet bowl, you know, going into Passage Creek, which goes to the North Fork, which ends up, you know, in the main stem. And so we would uh, lose some some fish out of there at times. Um, and so we would have we run into these big walleye down in the Warren Dam area. That's where they would end up. They like that particular area. And so we knew that the growth potential was there. We didn't we weren't really sure whether or not they would take off and uh, become as numerous as they are now to where there would actually be a fishery and you really don't know until you, you start stocking. And so we waded into it. Um, you know, again, with the walleye management plan, we have a certain stocking range that biologists can choose from to stock of water. And we chose a lower end of the scale hmm. and we, we remain in that lower end of the scale because it's successful and there's no need to overtax a system with a predator. And we want to see how this you know plays out. But the, it's working very well. And we saw a lot of fish, you know, a lot of young fish this year that survived from the, the spring stocking at a few of our sample sites. And we actually, you know, I, I, I fibbed a little bit, but we actually did have some surplus fish this year. So I did give it a double stocking. That was strategic because we're losing two of our best hatchery managers this year to retirement. And so... My concern was, you know, a brand new hatchery manager coming into a hatchery that's, you know, expected to raise the same amount of walleye that they have all the time, which is, I think is close to a million walleye. Damn. Um, that's going to be tough. That's a tough yeah. task. And so that's why Front Royal's jumping in this year to help out. And so hopefully we can meet our allocation. But just in case we don't, we have that that denser stocking rate this year to hold us over if we miss the stocking completely. But I was really pleased that I was seeing, you know, young, and it's again, it's they grow from, you know, mm -hmm. one and a half inches to 12 inches from spring to when wow. I sample them in the fall. It's incredible. How many did you stock? 
Oh, uh, off the top of my head, I think the allocation's twenty thousand typically, and I think we did a double stocking, which again still remains within that range. It's just and this a is higher on the, end, on the main stem. On the main stem. Yeah, so only I think it's important stem. to note this because I want to say too. I know one one thing we hear from putting this information out. Um, locations different things like you're talking about musky like people are you know like we're blowing up these you know blowing sites and spots. stuff and everybody's yep. going to be going there and and there was a misconception out there and, and he reminded me that because you had said that before so people need to understand mm -hmm. through the state's efforts you know forty thousand while i have gone into the river system mm -hmm. so there's not going to be a depletion based on what your all's efforts are doing and that the reason they're catching in part is because you guys continue to stock. And I think that is information we can't shout that loud enough out there to the, the public to let them know that this is what you guys are doing behind the scenes. And we don't always see you out there doing it. And, right. And, but we'll go out and catch them. Yeah. You know, and they're not always, to your point, they're not always naturally, you know, reproduced by that, you know, in that natural setting. So right. we just need to keep driving that home, I think. And that's probably something we'll look into down the road. Mm -hmm. You know, once we have you know, five, six, seven years mm -hmm. under our belt and mm -hmm. this thing's taken off uh, and remains, mm -hmm. you know, stable. Right. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll mark the fish similar to what we did with gotcha. the smallmouth bass and, and we'll see if they're, they're spawning in the mm -hmm. wild and kind of what percentage is, is made up of that. Mm -hmm. um, but for now, we're just enjoying the ride. That's great. You know, it's, yeah. you know, it's, it, they're, they're growing over 30 inches long. That's I mean, awesome. they're just, and they're getting girthy again. Shenandoah girth. Yeah. You know, they're just they're fat that. fish. So here, here's a hot take for all of your other uh, <clears throat> friends in the DWR. What state record would you think the Shenandoah would give up first, a walleye or a muskie? Neither. The, the walleye's 15 pounds. 15 pounds, 15 ounces. I think that's that might be doable. It might be doable. Um, I've seen some really big walleye come out of the New River, though. Oh yeah, that's yeah, that, the uh, genetics but we, down there. We have New River genetics. Really? Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, we we collect. You know, the New River is has a native endemic strain of walleye, I'm and so <laughs> we we collect from that uh, that river uh, the broodfish, so that we can stock you know uh, the fry right back in there the 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 native strain and and keep it keep it robust keep that's that population cool. robust. And then we're able to use the that strain elsewhere. And I, I, we were hoping to just keep the the um, New River strain in the main stem Shenandoah, but uh, we had we had to use the Stanton River one year. You know, it, there's a little bit of a mixed bag there. So um, the the we ask for New River every year, but um, sometimes we'll get the Stanton that's, River dude, that's awesome. fish as well. Which the Stanton River fish are no slouches no, either they no. they're, they're looking pretty good as well that's freaking so cool. i want to ask too since we're talking about different species um trout i know you i think pretty sure you're a trout guy too um the i've, I've gotten word or hear see some from some of your publications um whirling disease so two questions maybe talk a little bit about that but then also kind of what does the trout stocking look like in virginia how is that looking um moving forward because we got that those anglers as well trout anglers well, uh, my my position has changed a little bit. You know, my counterpart Brad Fink is the yep. statewide cold mm -hmm. water coordinator, okay. and so he deals a lot with with the the trout mm -hmm. issues and stuff. Um, but um, yeah, the whirl I mean, the whirling disease that's incredible frustration that mm -hmm. we that we had to you know remove those fish from the the hatchery gotcha. and basically from the from the systems, mm -hmm. but. To me, it's a win. You know, it's it shows that our biosecurity mm -hmm. protocols are working. Right. That's gotta, true. I didn't think of that. You yeah. kept it out yeah. of the. We huh. kept it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, it's a shame. Um, we never, you know, we don't want to stock sick fish either. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So, you know, no one wants to catch a, you know, disfigured fish or, mm -hmm. a, you know, a sickly fish. You know, we want to put, you know, as, as healthy as possible. It is, you know, aquaculture. So, I mean, the, the fish are stacked in there. You've mm -hmm. seen a stocked fish for versus a wild fish. They don't look as pretty as the wild fish, but the recreational value of those stock trout are huge. You know, that's, that's where people get their start. And so, um, and we want to affect the numbers in, is that this year or next year? Or what is that? It'll is that be, it'll be this year. This yeah. year. Mm -hmm. okay. I think we should get Brad on the phone yeah. for a potential interview. Talk to him about this. Yeah. 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 He'd be a good guest for you. Um, this year's especially challenging again with the drought, you know, like mm -hmm. the Corsi Springs is our local hatchery that, that provides, um, trout for the valley you know from winchester all the way down to you know mm -hmm. lexington out into the mountains and so 
that hatchery draws its water from a spring, which is adjacent to the cow pasture river. And the, I think the last time I heard the spring was running at like half the velocity that it normally mm -hmm. is running. And this is two years in a row now. No boy. Bueno. Um, last year, everywhere else, you know, we had good rain and it wasn't a big deal, but you know, in that little valley of the cow pasture and the bull pasture, it was dry. And so we had some struggles last year and we're going to have some struggles again this year too. We just don't have the water in the hatchery and, um, it's, it's, it's a shame. It's, it's, it's a, it's a frustration and we, we, we and we can't control it. Mm -hmm. The the guys at Corzy the, and the gals, um, they've done a fantastic job trying their best to, um, keep as many fish on campus as possible. Mm -hmm. This year they had individual pumps running to recirc tank water back into the tank so that they can have a little bit more flow added mm. to that particular population of fish within mm. that tank so they could have a little bit higher of a density mm. and try to keep you know bacterial diseases mm. down and stuff like that so they're they're trying everything they, they can think of but you just can't make more water <laughs> no and i think it's still good another example of just getting the right information out and then that way people know like well, if you communicate we're all adults here we can you know we there's an understanding if you go out there it just may not be a great year mm -hmm. you know that happens and it doesn't help um, that you broke records the year right, before the drought. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We we stocked more fish than we ever had yeah. out of that out of that hatchery in, you know, twenty twenty one, I think. Yeah. Drought year twenty twenty two, drought year twenty twenty three. So, I guess reality, too, yeah. is though the nice thing in Virginia with the year-round stock, because I was thinking today, too, about how it used to be a trout season that came in at a certain time, went mm -hmm. out, and, and it, there was a big push then. But, you know, now that you can, there, you can still find streams out there and waters out there and, you know, I guess maybe potentially catch some holdovers or there might be some brookies or whatever if you're, if you are that diehard trout fisherman and don't want to go after any other species, that there's still opportunities to get out on the water. Sure. So... Yeah, I mean, we, we do have some some great wild trout fisheries, you know, within our region. Now is not the time to fish them because mm -hmm. they're very low. Right. Um, but, you know, in the springtime and in the early summertime, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we've got kind of the best of both worlds. Where right. If you like stock trout, we've got stock trout available for you mm -hmm. within that particular system. And then there's a robust wild trout fishery there as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've started stocking sterile fish in those systems and we never mix, you know, we never stock browns or rainbows into directly on top of, you know, brook trout. You know, we, we don't want that competition there and we don't want the potential of them starting to spawn in that stream, which, you know, these stock trout, they have the capability of spawning, but they're not the smartest fish. Their, their instincts are not like the wild trout. But just to be careful, we, we we don't stock, you know, over top of those those wild brook trout populations. And if we stock the the uh, brook trout over top of them, in the case of like Dry River in Rockingham County or Paddy Run here in Frederick County, yeah. you know, we try to put um, sterile brook trout in there as well, just as an extra precaution. So we, we and you yeah, still have we, some lakes too. I mean, there's still some lakes that'll hold trout. And uh, yeah, that's and that's what we're earlier. we're having to target right now. Mm -hmm. You know, we we have to get rid of some fish in the hatchery because we've been holding them, holding them, holding them all summer, and now it's you have to put them somewhere, and we don't have the space in the hatchery to or the water to to split them uh, into another pond, and so they have to go out, and so we're forced to stock the ponds. We'd love to be stocking, you know, mm. some of the streams and stuff like that as mm. well, but there's just not a whole lot of water yeah. out there but the good me. thing virginia is diverse and we do, and there's other opportunities i mean like mm -hmm. i say you got to roll with it and, and go out and do some yeah, other things so. in fact um you know lake frederick right over the hill here mm -hmm. greg Sanner, i was talking to him yep. on the phone he said they're chewing right now uh -huh. and they're fat that's good they are yeah. just getting real fat on the bluebacks mm -hmm. and uh you know some of the pictures on on his page mm -hmm. again we sample yeah. it in the spring so I, you know i don't mm -hmm. i don't i don't uh, look at these fish in the fall mm -hmm. but they're uh, relative weights look mm -hmm. very good. They look very catch fat. rates are going up. I mean, mm -hmm. the people are happy with it now. Well, ever since we broke all that about the blueback mm -hmm. last fall, and mm -hmm. then people started to use forward facing sonar to find them, it's insane mm -hmm. to see some of the winter pictures of people following mm -hmm. just the schools of blueback throwing umbrella rigs. Yeah, I'm more fascinated. Like when you look at a Lake Murray or a Hartwell that has had blueback in it for God knows how long. So those fish had generations of being conditioned to that. How long had the bass 
in mm. Frederick had to be conditioned to the new four to change up their behavior. Is that what, 20, less than 20 years, probably, right? You think like that's fascinating how quickly their predatory nature changed. Yeah, it was it was really fast. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we were we were getting reports. Well, we when we caught bluebacks. I can't remember what the year it was now, um, uh, maybe like five years ago or something like that. And then the next year, I can remember going out and night shocking and seeing like the pelagic schools in our lights because we sample it at night. And I was just like, oh, boy, this is serious. You know, the, 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 the reports were correct. And I think that year we got reports from Greg that like the catch rates are in the in the tank. You know, people aren't catching anything. And mm -hmm. then the year after that or maybe that fall, Greg was like, oh, they're all out in the middle. The bass didn't go. I was like, yeah, they didn't go anywhere. They, they're pelagic <laughs> now. You know, they moved out. And so that's it, it didn't take long at all. I mean, those those fish, they slide down so easy compared to a spiny sunfish. And so that's where those fish are oriented now. They're in deep water and they're right below those schools of, of bait fish. And they're from what I understand, they're mostly in the main bowl mm -hmm. of the lake. Mm -hmm. And and that's where they're hanging out. And that's really frustrating because, you know, that, there's a lot of bank fishing access at Lake Frederick, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of anglers that enjoy fishing for largemouth bass, channel catfish, which we stock in that lake. And the, the bluegill sunfish in the red ear population was off the charts as far as size and, and quality. You know, we had 12 inch red ear sunfish on the regular coming out of that lake. And unfortunately with blueback herring, you know, they are filter feeders. They're taking away a lot of that zooplankton not only from the sunfish, but from the largemouth as well when they're in those early life stages and they're egg eaters on top of that. And the sunfish are spawning, you know, somewhat close with the blueback. So it's a little bit, you know, it, it, they're in and out, that kind of thing. But um, sunfish really take it on the chin when you have bluebacks introduced to a, a resource. And I was surprised at how quickly we saw the the impact of that. And I'm hopeful that maybe this was just a bad year, but the, the data that I looked at this spring from our, or the, right now from the spring sample, we're, we just we did not catch a lot of bluegill and we did not catch a lot of red ear sunfish. And Greg said that the catch rate of, of bluegill and, and red ear, normally you'd see those pictures of them um, stretched out on like a log or something that someone had harvested that day or a stringer or a cooler. Those the, those days were, were gone this, this summer. Maybe it was just a bad year, that's mm -hmm. that's fisheries for you sometimes it's just a bad year and, mm -hmm. and you come back and, and the fish are there again but when we we aged fish from from lake frederick when the bluebacks were first introduced so that we had a before and after comparison of the eight of the age and growth for the largemouth bass maybe they maybe they improve most likely they will their growth rates will improve because of this new forage base but i was more interested in the the sunfish as well and what i found was because of the high harvest rate of, of that fishery, um, which it was sustainable, the sunfish were only about three years old and then pulled out. There was a couple big, you know, sunfish, big red ears that were five, six years old, but the, those bluegill and those younger red ear, they only, they only were in there till they're about three and then they're out of there. So, you know, like I said, blueback arrived maybe about five years ago. I should really know that by heart. Um, but you know, three years from that point, if you're not having good reproduction from the sunfish, out they go, and we're at that time now. Whereas you know, where you know, there's just not enough adults to really you know replicate themselves, or more than likely, it's more that the early life stage is now put under stress from those bluebacks, and so they're not getting good spawns off. And so all it takes is three years before your population goes downhill. What about vegetation too? Like I know That's the grass is coming back. I wonder and too, water that willow, that I would. Think. Yeah, it's, it's water willow. willow. Yeah, yeah I, had, I heard Odenkirk okay. singing, <laughs> singing praises about water willow the other day, which I'm I'm completely in in his camp ab That's about. Cool. And I and I it was interesting that he mentioned that like all these lakes just showed up with water willow. All I of thought a sudden, that was interesting. I wonder well. I wonder if Lake Frederick like followed that same timeline yeah. because I don't mm. I don't know if I remember water willow being there as prevalently as it is now. And maybe it's just because in the past, you know, before we, you know, put a big load of grass carp in there, you know, years ago now, um, maybe I was just more distracted by the the submerged aquatic veg. There was used to be just huge, you know, mm -hmm. rafts of coontail in there. 
Um, and now that's gone. And so maybe I'm just more focused on the water willow, mm -hmm. but the water willow looks very healthy and robust now compared mm -hmm. to where it used to be. And, and maybe the, the lake is just, you know, lakes fill in over time. And so maybe mm -hmm. some of those shallow arms are just starting to get more encroached by the, mm -hmm. the water willow. But, uh, I do expect some of that submerged aquatic veg to, to reappear the next few years because we haven't stocked any grass carp in there for years with the purpose of allowing that big year class to kind of work its way out of the system. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, you know, get some of that that vegetation back mm -hmm. with the hope that maybe we can create some ambush points for right. for those bass mm -hmm. so that maybe they're not quite as pelagic. Yeah. You know, and I, survival, I, know. I would think, it's, too. Would it not, does it not help the survival, too? I mean, both it sure. works both ways. I mean, yeah. survival, you also get more of that lower end food chain type deal going on. And then right. I think it's just good and healthy for the, so anyway, but time will tell on that too. So yeah, maybe the sunfish will be able to rebound a little bit, yeah. you know, with that, with that SAV coming mm -hmm. back. Cause you guys have put habitat in too. They've done a lot of Christmas trees every yes. couple of years yep. and you guys do a good job of that too. So I, I need to go back and look at, we've got to be close to 2000 Christmas trees within the last, <laughs> so, I mean, just, yeah. we load that place up. Yep. It's just so easy. I mean, mm -hmm. Greg yeah. is such a great partner. You guys are such yeah. a great partner with, mm -hmm. with doing that work up there, you know, and they just mm -hmm. dump, you know, 200 to 300 yeah. Christmas trees in the parking, the parking lot. lot's full of it. And, and we just chip away at it and work it yeah. up. Yeah. It's just, it's, mm -hmm. it's too good to not take advantage of. So mm -hmm. we plan on continuing that this year again. And for those that don't know, they also post that on their website. I keep I talk all the time about their website and how good it is. And mm -hmm. so, those specific locations where they've mm -hmm. they've submerged that that habitat is uh, visible on their map, and so you can go and fish that. And, and sometimes visible in person too, because yeah, we, that's right. We, we do try to cater to the bank One by the too. dock over there or the pier. Yeah, off yeah. We right. we try to put them by the pier, and we mm -hmm. we don't want to get we don't want you to get hung up in them. So that's like. Right. We try to put them shallow so that you can mm -hmm. cast to them. Mm -hmm. Doesn't stop people from casting into them, mm -hmm. but um, you know that's the goal is to try to create a visible habitat um, so that you can cast to it and catch a fish off of it, rather than you know just casting out there into twenty feet of water, you know snagged again on, on that Christmas tree down there. Um, you know, we try to leave that to the, the boat anglers that have the, the <laughs> fancy sonar now, or they can just hover it right over top of the reef or whatever the case may be. Now, I, I do have one more question, and you just tied in there with, with the sonar, but um, is there anything else on your slides that you think would be good information for the public? Um, I don't I don't think so. I think, you know, we talked about the, the different uh, brood sources for next year. Uh, the one cool thing that we're doing is we're, we're trying to do a staggered approach when we bring in our fish. Um, we're going to try to pond spawn some fish. Now, we've never, we've never tried that at Front Royal before, but South Carolina... <clears throat> exclusively pond spawns their fish and it's pretty mm. interesting I've, I've got a slide here basically what it is it's a walmart tupperware bin shallow maybe about five inches tall and it has shag carpeting in the bottom so to speak like a thick astroturf and then a pile of rocks and they put a turtle guard because they got loads of turtles in south carolina i guess <laughs> And so it's basically a rectangular PVC that floats over top of it to keep birds away, to keep turtles away. And apparently the smallmouth take to these things within these ponds because they just they don't have any other option. It's a mud bottom pond. This, you know, this this system is an old school system down in South Carolina. So hmm. going back to Front Royal, Rappahannock fish are coming in to one side of the concrete raceways outside and then Mari fish are going to go into the pond. We're going to try them in the pond this year. We're going to make the exact same bins, the exact mm -hmm. same AstroTurf, try to keep it, like I said, keeping the variables down. And we're going to put them in into the pond and they'll have to go out, the hatchery staff, they'll have to wait around and check those every day. So we'll have to manipulate the pond depth a little bit. And I think we've got that figured out. Um, these fish are really spooky when you bring them in, obviously. There's a big tower. At, you know, you can see it at the north end of the of the pond there. Um, and that tower is where those fish are going to be hiding out for the most part. And so we'll we'll be kind of making kind of a, an arc around that tower with these these spawning baskets and then monitoring them and see how they do. The pond will warm up faster than the raceways will. So we're hopeful that the Mari fish spawn first. And we're able to extract the fry out of that pond, put it in one of the three other ponds that's set up, drain the pond that the Mari fish are in, remove those brood fish, take them back to the river. The Rappahannock fish 
you know, they'll they'll spawn when they're ready in, in the concrete raceways. Those those fry will go into pond two or three if they're really successful. And then if we're good, if we just have tons of fry and we don't need any more, then okay, we're good. But the the Mari the Mari fish pond will drain that down, like I said, and then we'll set it up again and we'll mm -hmm. get it full of zooplankton as fast as we can. Typically, it takes about eight to 10 days to do that. And so timing is everything. And so if the Rappahannock fish have already mm, spawned gotcha. and we have nothing to put in that pond, then we're going to bring Moomaw fish in because they're later in their spawning cycle than the, the river fish. And we'll put those in the concrete raceway <laughs> and we'll let them spawn. And then we'll put those into Love the brood it. fish. So we'll have four full ponds of smallmouth. That's, that's awesome. our plan anyway. <laughs> that's exciting. Well, that's almost a natural thing too. It's that's like really you talk about an initial spawn or like how the spawn doesn't always happen at the same time too. Where mm -hmm. you'll have a you know kind of a pre a spawn and then it might be late. I think this year it seemed to be late for some. I think in the river. It was really weird really this year. Weird the this main year, stem but... had spawners in April because mm -hmm. we had a really early warm up, mm -hmm. and then um, it got really cold and everything shut yeah. off. And so when we went, when we went out sampling. Uh, in July on the main stem at all of our sites, backpack shocking for the fish health stuff. There was a lot of sick fish in the shallows. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of sick young smallmouth. And we had fish that were almost 120 millimeters, which is really big because yeah. it's a really early spawned fish in April. And we had fish that were, you know, 50 to 60 millimeters. Wow. And so you'll have that staggered spawn. And we'll see that in the fall too, where we'll have 130 millimeter fish on the South Fork and then a 70 millimeter fish in the South Fork. So, you know, you have these, they, they go on the nest, they go off the nest, you know, a, a pulse comes through, you know, washes things out, they rebuild, cold front comes through, they come off the nest. So the same thing's going to impact uh, the hatchery as well, but the pond is going to be less susceptible to those big swings that the raceway right. will have right. um, issues with. And really the raceways are, are better off too, the concrete raceways, the harvest pavilion's the one that really felt those cold snaps and stuff like that because the you know passage creek would just chill back down again and they're just in there shivering not mm -hmm. in the mood at all so but yeah the you know the main stem speaking of of young fish and and i know you guys have have heard me say you know some sick young fish as well but we actually had a a pretty good spawn on the main stem this year two years in a row now and we've seen an increase in the number of you know, seven to 11 inch fish, the the number of quality fish, and those mid range fish are, are coming along. Some of the real big fish we didn't see, um, it's potential, potentially they just aged out of the system. Also, again, very clear water, right. fish may have gone deep. We just, we didn't get a chance to encounter them, but um, I was really encouraged with the main stem this year. You know, we didn't have a, you know, lights out spawn, but uh, we did see a, a pretty decent spawn uh, despite the fact that we had some some fish health issues, which was really encouraging, because I just I just wonder what could have been mm -hmm. you know, if we had a, a fully healthy year class. And again, we we had a drought on top of that, so again, that's going to have a negative impact as well. But to have two you know average spawns in a row is really good news for the main stem because it hadn't had good spawning yeah. for a long time. And so I'm really encouraged. Um, and We've hopeful. been hearing good reports in here too. I mean, good. as far as like you know, customers where they're posting pictures or sending us pictures, yeah. and man, it is like especially for this time of year. I'm just and then again, knowing that uh, as it gets colder, you know, the months of December, January, February, man, there could be some you know five pound, four or five pounders that we're, we might see mm -hmm. potentially. You know what I mean? So man, I hope we get a uh, shot. I agree I with you. Hope we get a shot of rain and, and people can enjoy yeah. some winter fishing both in the South Fork yeah. and the Main Stem this year because. Yeah. There's some really nice fish out there. Oh, there is. And then <clears throat> this is a this is a selfish plug, but above my head, guys, um, we're still number one in the Google Analytics when it comes to wintertime Shenandoah fishing. I did a, a Hidden Gems episode with Travis Eden. We caught almost to a 20-pound bag of our best five on the main stem. Mm -hmm. And really, as I incorporated in that video, was Shelby talking about the fish kill. And you really don't appreciate where you are unless you know where you've been. And mm -hmm. when you think, when you go back 10, 15, 20 years, when you mm -hmm. thought this river would never recover, and even though we're talking about one or two spawns that we're glad are happening, the mm -hmm. river has come such a long way. Yes. It really has to where 
I don't know if you look at like kayak tournament fishing data, but when they do the, they have a big bronze back, the battle of, of three rivers tournament, and you get to pick from the Rappahannock, the upper Potomac or the Shenandoah. The last two years, the winners have come from the Shenandoah. People pick the mm-hmm. Shenandoah because they think they can catch 90 inches of smallmouth, mm-hmm. And that speaks major when you think mm-hmm. when I was a kid mm-hmm. with the lesions and the fish kill, this thing was dead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's come a long way. It really has. Yeah. And this has been incredible again because again, every time you do this stuff, we're always just yeah. like it's to know, to see, not know, but see what goes into this stuff. People don't realize this. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just really good. Again, hats off to Fish and DMV for providing a platform to communicate to anglers out there what these guys are doing. I mean, 19 years in in Virginia department. And then Odenkirk was what thirty getting 40, up thirty four hundred fifty yeah, four hundred. <laughs> but you guys, and that's just two that you know we've had on here, and it's uh, when you've had more. But I'm just saying, like it's you guys are doing an outstanding job. I know I appreciate everything you guys do, and we as we do, and just keep doing what you're doing. And and let me say this too: if if people do have questions or anything, do you have a place where they can can reach out to you and talk, or what's the best way to to contact you? Yeah, we, you can share my email address. That's that's the the direct line to, to get to me. You know, we you can always email the web too if you have an, a, a question about a different water body. You mm-hmm. know, because I'm not in charge of the James or the right. New or some of those. But um, but yeah, for for questions about the Shenandoah River, um, you can they can just email me. That that'd be that'd be fine. That's and, awesome too. And if you're fishing the Shenandoah River, guys, I'll also throw in the River Keepers too, just mm-hmm. to keep everyone kind of in the loop as well, Mark. Mm-hmm. Um, that'd be a good one. Um, is there anything else that we need to plug while you're here? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. I think uh, this has been a, a great discussion. It always is. We mm-hmm. appreciate you guys for for helping us get the word out. Um, you know, it helps to go onto a podcast. Mm-hmm where there's a lot of positive Mm -hmm. attitudes and, and, uh, Mm -hmm. and you guys just such, um, great hosts and, uh, and we, we appreciate the opportunity to get the word out about, about things. And, Mm -hmm. and you're right. I mean, you're, there's a lot of frustrations with, with, uh, with working with these resources because a lot of it's out of, out of control, out of our control Mm -hmm. in certain cases, we can only do so many things. Um, but you're not going to find a more, passionate group of individuals then mm-hmm. you know you may not like some of our decisions right. and s- there's always like this well a b and c and d happen so that's what we had to do right e yep. but and some of that's not always told and so i think it's important to to have these opportunities to tell the story of mm-hmm. you know it, things went real bad at front royal this year but yeah. we found a way to make it yeah, work that's right and and that's that's one thing that i can say about myself and and our colleagues is that we we usually find a way to make it work and mm-hmm. man there's, there's a lot of a lot of struggles at times mm-hmm. but um but we love our resources and we want to make the best opportunities we can for our uh, constituents and stakeholders mm-hmm. and yeah we appreciate you helping us get the word out guys link in the episode description everything we talked about today if you feel like it please join us on patreon our patreon supporter of the day is jason vetter our overall goal is to start our own nonprofit, the future fish foundation just to help with some supplemental stocking whatever the dwr needs and so if you'd like to learn about that or my five-year plan go to patreon check us out otherwise we'll see you next time on fishing the dmv bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your host thomas aarons fishing the dmv is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.